If you're getting started in property investing, what is it you buy? Is it a house or a flat? Maybe you already have a strategy or maybe you'll just be led by the fast talking salesperson at the agency. In this video, I want to break down why I invest in both houses and flats and also the advantages and disadvantages of each. If you're watching my videos for the first time, my name is Saj Hussain, and on this channel I share with you my 15 years of property investing experience to ultimately help you get further faster in your own property investing journey. When it comes to houses versus flats and trying to decide which is the right one to buy, it's really important to just understand the advantages and disadvantages, and that's what I want to go into in just a moment. But some of the basics first of all, what's the real difference between the two in terms of ownership and what is it that you end up with? And this is really the crux of it. When you buy an apartment, which is really just a posh word for a flat, when you're buying an apartment versus a house, what is it that you actually end up with? When you're purchasing a house, often you're buying the building and the land on it and essentially known as a freehold. I say often because it's not always the case, it's not 100% of the case that that's what it will be, but the vast majority of the time, that's essentially what you're doing. You're buying the building and the land that it sits on. Now, when you're buying a flat, what essentially you're doing is getting the right to use that building, that space within the building even, for a certain period of time. So let's say you've got a, a building with 10 apartments in it, the one that's yours, number three, when you go past that door, number three, everything within that is essentially yours for a certain period of time. And that period depends on the length of the lease. The lease might be say 99 years upwards. So that means for the next 99 years, you can use that. It's very likely you're probably not gonna live uh, another 99 years. I'm sorry to break that to you, but that's essentially what it means. You've got the right to that. And that has a value, hence it can be resold and passed to somebody else. Now that brings us all benefits and disadvantages as well, which is exactly what we're gonna go into now. Let's first of all start with the advantages of flats. Well, one of the biggest ones that I see is the lower entry point in terms of getting into the market, essentially a lower purchase price, and it means you need less money to be able to get onto the property ladder to be able to buy an apartment versus a house. Now, this is not always the case. Sometimes you see these amazing, stunning apartments that cost significantly more than a house in the area. But generally speaking, you'll see a house is going to be much more expensive than an apartment will be in the same area. And often it's because the, the apartments are a lot smaller than a house would be anyway. Another advantage is you don't have to take care of the outside of the building, generally speaking. So the roof, the externals, like cladding, for example, this is not really your responsibility. Somebody else takes care of this, essentially the freeholder, which I'll talk about more in a moment. They take care of that, so it's not your uh, responsibility, even the communal areas, the hallways, staircases, the lifts. Somebody else is looking after all these things, and even if there's a swimming pool, they're taking care of that for you. So the advantage is you're just focusing on looking after the inside of the building when you go through your front door rather than anything else that's on the outside. This is generally speaking because occasionally you'll get an apartment say with its own garden like a ground floor one and you might have that responsibility. But again, we're speaking very generally because there's a lot of specifics that you need to be mindful of in terms of houses and apartments. Another advantage that I've found when it comes to flats, it's often easier to find motivated sellers of flats. The reason being because the very nature of leases and the way they're set up, it means that more problems can exist and it's easier to find people who end up in a little bit of a mess who really just want to get out and are more motivated to sell that property. One of the best deals that I ever did is when I bought a small block of flats which cost £25,000 each. It sounds crazy now when I think about it, it wasn't even all that long ago, at £25,000 a flat and they rent out between £475 to £500 each. When you look at that, that's more than 20% return, uh, annualized return on that uh, investment. Now, there's some challenges with those in terms of the price point and how it was, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. But essentially, you know, that deal was only possible because the seller was very motivated and there were complications around the lease and the freehold and how it had been set up. Let's now look at the disadvantages of owning apartments as investment property. Well, one of the most common ones is really just understanding that really you don't own that particular property. So what I mean by that is you have a very long rent. Um, so you take on a, uh, an apartment that you've purchased and let's say it comes with a lease of 99 years. That means you've got it for 99 years. But really, is it that dissimilar from you renting a property when you're a tenant? The fact is you might be on a tenancy day that's six months. In this example, you've got a tenancy that's 99 years. That comes with some terms and conditions as well, again, which we'll talk about in a moment. But essentially, that's what you're doing. You've got the use of that building for that time. It also means you can resell it to somebody else during that time as well, hence where the value of that property comes from. That means that somebody else can take the same benefit that you've had after you sell it on uh, to them. 
But if you've got at least, say, 99 years, what happens is each year the clock is ticking down and that means it's reducing by a year. So let's say you live there for 10 years and then you decide to move on. At this point now, the lease that's remaining is only 89 years. So what ultimately happens when it goes back down to zero, when it means you've run out of that lease? Well, theoretically what happens, it goes back to the freeholder, it reverts back to the ownership of the freeholder because they've just given you the right to use it for 99 years. Now this can present some challenges, particularly around financing, and this is something many people don't necessarily realize when they're investing in property at the length of leases. Everyone thinks they're gonna live a, a long time, and you know, I hope you do, but the reality is 99 years is a long time, but when you talk about the context of property, it can drop quite quickly, and also the values can drop with that as well. So when the number of years remaining on a lease starts falling to about 70 or less, it can become quite difficult to mortgage out property. And the reason being is because when the lenders are providing a mortgage, let's say they give you a 20 or 30 year mortgage, that means by the time that mortgage is finished, you've now only left with say 40 odd years or 50 years left on that lease, which is gonna make it exceptionally difficult to be able to sell that property on to somebody else because the clock again is ticking, the value is shrinking as well on that building rather than increasing, which is what normally happens on buildings. Now, of course, there are ways to extend this, but it means that you have to pay to extend the period of the lease. The freeholder ultimately has control of the building. They own the, uh, the land that the building sits on and they determine some um, terms and conditions around how that's gonna run. And when they're issuing you a lease, your lease for 99 years, that will stipulate what you can and can't do within the building. Now, there are some arrangements and some protections in place in terms of how a freehold and leaseholder arrangements work and those particular relationships. But as a leaseholder, you're really not in a great place. You're influenced and controlled by the decision that somebody else might wanna make. Essentially, the freeholder, they've got uh, control over what ultimately happens. That means you have some limitations. So for instance, uh, as your lease starts to decrease, yes, you can, you've got the right to increase that. You have to serve what's called a section 42 notice on the freeholder, which is a right for you to be able to extend the lease. And then that way you can get an extension the figures are worked out in terms of what the market value is, etc., etc., and you'd have to pay to get an increase done. So effectively, it's not a case that they'll just issue it. You have to pay for that privilege to be able to extend the lease further. Now, when the lease starts getting short on a property, you have to pay this extra amount of money to effectively get the value back up again to its, its value equivalent to all the other apartments maybe in the building as well. Occasionally, you'll see an apartment that's, say, sold or a flat at a very low price compared to maybe some of the others in the area, and that's often because the amount of years left on that lease has been shrinking to a low number, which means its value has now also dropped. And one of the things I see investors sometimes do, they rush to purchase these properties, particularly inexperienced ones, with the, with the plan of I'll purchase it because it's cheap and then I'll just sell it back straight back on um, because it's cheap and I'll just extend the lease. Yes, you can extend the lease, but in fact, uh, as a new buyer of that lease, you have to wait up to two years before you can do that. Now, the, the freeholder might do it sooner, but generally they, have no, they don't have to do it within two years. So that can present itself a challenge. A little way around that is what you do, you get the seller to extend the lease or get that ball rolling just as you're about to purchase. So then when you become the new owner, it comes with the extended lease and you don't have to wait around for that to happen. So then that way, if you're flipping it on, you can make some money. Yes, you'd cover the cost, but it means that you fix the problem as you're purchasing the property. So earlier I was talking about motivated sellers of apartments and the reason that can be because there's some other challenges. So for example, one of the ones, it could be that yes, you want to extend the lease, but the freeholder has disappeared on you, which is called an, an absent freeholder, which means you can't actually get hold of them to be able to extend it and you end up in this problematic situation. And sometimes it could be the freeholder and the leaseholder don't really see eye to eye in terms of what's going on in that building. So, you know, there are those challenges to deal with, but ultimately by somebody else having control and influence in that building, the freeholder, it also means that you're gonna have extra costs to deal with. And there's two main ones, which is ground rent and service charges. So the ground rent is essentially you're paying rent for uh, the land that the building actually sits on, the apartment block sits on. That apartment block could be a block of two apartments. It could be a block of 200, it doesn't really matter. The fact that it sits on that land and they are effectively the landlord and you're paying a rent. Now that isn't really generally very much. It could be anything from 50 pound a year, essentially about a pound a week, going up to maybe even 500 pounds. Now you have to be careful when you're looking to purchase properties like this because sometimes um, you might have within the agreements, the, uh, the, the leasehold agreements, that the ground rent might even double, say in 10 years, which you're starting to see some of these things happen over the last few years, which is why the government has started to look more carefully on freeholder and leaseholder arrangements because of some of the, um, let's say, less scrupulous things that have been going on in the marketplace um, right now with these arrangements. 
Then with regard to service charge, a service charge is essentially a contribution from each of the, uh, uh, each of the apartment owners to, uh, for the upkeep of the building, if you like. So that's the maintenance of the building, clean the windows, ensuring the actual building itself, um, clean the communal areas, the staircases, uh, servicing the lifts, looking after the communal space outside, such as mowing the, mowing the lawn, if there's a communal space there. Um, uh, you know, sweeping uh, the uh, the pathway, the car parks, you know, all these things that need to be taken care of within an apartment building is essentially what a service charge is for. Now, sometimes these service charges can be pretty horrendous in terms of how they're set up. Other times it might be more reasonable. It just depends on who's set up the freeholder and how who the freeholder is and how they've set this arrangement up. And sometimes the freeholder will set up the arrangement and issue out to a management company and sometimes these then get sold on, the freeholders get sold on to somebody else uh, and you can see where there's so many different people involved and maybe the initial people aren't there anymore, different people have different interests and why it starts getting a little bit tricky. Now it doesn't mean that this is not a good deal, it's just understanding all the things that are involved. Now if you've got one of these really swanky apartments where you've got a concierge a service and you've got a nice swimming pool and a jacuzzi, uh, you're essentially paying for all these things and these things will be paid through the communal service charge. Now when you're a landlord, you're an investor and you have a, a, an apartment that you're renting out, these service charges and ground rents are things that you're going to have to absorb, you're going to be paying for, you can't pass these to your tenant as an additional payment. There may be something that's built into the rent to cover some of that but the rent is ultimately going to be driven by what the market rates are. Now logic dictates that an older building is probably going to have more maintenance requirements, essentially you'll have higher service charges. That isn't always the case. Sometimes you look at these brand new apartment blocks that are just being built, everything is brand spanking new and the service charges are up here. And that could be many reasons why they've set it like that, but it's important that you understand what the service charges are and how they might change as well. And occasionally you'll get a major expense that needs to be dealt with, for example, painting the outside of the building, uh, replacing a roof, for example, or more recently the issues around cladding. And so what happens is when the, the, uh, the management company looks after the building, determines that this work needs to be done, what they will do is they will contact um, the individual leaseholders and effectively notify them. This is known as a major works notice and effectively what they're doing, they're taking the cost of doing those works and dividing it up by the number of apartments in that particular building and they're having to cover that cost. So hence, hence a lot of pain right now for those that are living in apartment buildings and have apartment buildings and the issues all around having to reclad or change cladding on some buildings right now. Now you might be thinking right now, hey Saj, I've seen some freehold flats. Does that mean I can avoid all these hassles if I take on a freehold flat? No. If you're looking at freehold flats and your disadvantages could be significantly higher than an ordinary leasehold flat. And the reason being because with a freehold flat, it means that you've got effectively complete control of that particular unit, but there's no arrangement for the entire building, generally speaking. And that in itself can cause quite a lot of problems, which means there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about who takes care of what and how these things work, which again means that uh, from a mortgage point of view, the banks don't like it. So exceptionally difficult to borrow money against a freehold apartment. So generally, my opinion would be to stay away from freehold apartments. You want to find leaseholds, generally with good long leases that you're looking for. Talking about finance challenges, there's a number of other situations that can also present problems when trying to raise mortgages on these type of buildings. For, for example, high rise local authority tower blocks. If you've got an apartment, say that's above a fast food outlet, all of these can present challenges when you're trying to borrow money because there's other things going on in that building that the lenders may not necessarily be happy about. So you want to really be aware what is and isn't easily mortgageable when it comes to apartments. As property investors and landlords, one of the things we want to be able to do is add value to a property to increase its value and that means that the asset is more valuable than initially it started off being. And one of the ways, for example, we do that is increase the size of the building or change the number of bedrooms. So sometimes people look at apartments and think I'll take a, a say a, a one bedroom apartment and I'll split it into say two. So you've got a spacious one bedroom apartment that's been reconfigured into two. But generally speaking, again, this is something you can't really do, so a huge disadvantage unless you've got consent of the freeholder. So your lease will state that you can't make these kind of alterations without consent. Sometimes these consents are easy to get, other times it might be you need to um, 
let's say grease the palms of your freeholder to be able to get the consent to be able to do the things you want. And often you'll even see apartments, for example, that have been reconfigured and sold, but they haven't actually got the right consents in place as well because people are unaware that they need these. Often people don't read the lease. I've got a very good friend of mine who's a, a leaseholder specialist. And the first thing uh, you know, he will say if there's a query on a lease is, have you actually read the lease? And the vast majority of people will turn around, shrug their shoulders and say, no, I haven't actually read it. It's like 50, 60, 100 pages. I haven't actually read it. And they say, well, that's, those are all the terms and conditions around what you can do in and around that particular apartment. So remember, you know, with the lease, it means that somebody else has control and influence of it. So the one, the disadvantage being you can't just go and make these alterations and add the value. Something else also to be mindful of is when it comes to permitted development rights, which often we enjoy when it comes to adding value, these don't exist on apartments, which means that they actually aren't there. We can't just go and um, make some of the changes ordinarily that we would do within our PD rights, say we would as, uh, as we would on a house. Let's now talk about the advantages of houses as investments. Well, one of the biggest ones is the fact that you own the freehold. It means that you don't actually have somebody else really influencing what you can do to the property. So the changes, for example, you might be making are much, much easier. And of course, they come with permitted development rights, generally speaking, which means you can make certain types of alterations. So such as forcing up the value, taking a two bedroom house to a three bedroom, for example, by reconfiguring, say you're increasing its volume by extensions, converting loft space. Now, these kind of things mean that you're able to add value to that property, which is an absolute advantage when we talk about investing in property and forcing up that value. Another advantage in my experience has been that the people that will be staying in a house often will stay longer than those that will stay in an apartment. And so those that are staying in an apartment tend to be earlier on in their getting on their foot on the property ladder, as it were, their independence. It may be they've just started living on their own or maybe they're a couple of friends living together. And it might be that, that as they uh, settle down, that they move into something bigger, essentially a family house. And when uh, you look at family houses, and let's say you've got a family with kids, you know, the kids at local school, people working nearby, they're much more settled where they are in their life. And often they will stay longer and not really move around as much as those people that will stay in apartments. So in apartments, people are staying for a short period of time, where the advantage in a house is your tenants tend to stay for a much longer period of time and really more likely to treat it as a home, of course, depending on the type of tenants that you have. My experience has also been with houses that the prices will tend to rise significantly more over time than they do with apartments for the same amount of money that you might put in an apartment versus what you might be putting into a house. Now, this is not always the case, but generally speaking, this is what I've found, the house values will rise more and faster than they will in an apartment. And typically, let's say we look at new build apartment, if we roll the clock back to you know pre-credit crunch, the price are very, very high. You were paying premiums for these brand new apartments in the city center when the market crashed, they fell the most, those prices, they took the biggest hit. And then when the market started to recover a few years later and the prices started to rise again, they were the last ones to start recovering in terms of price. So the ones that fell the first and lost the most amount of value and took the longest to try to recover as well from that particular value. So in houses, you generally find that isn't necessarily the case. Houses will recover much quicker even in a downturn. And when the values increase, they increase more so than they do in apartments. And of course, the big one is in terms of getting finance, it tends to be much easier in houses, much more straightforward because you haven't got anybody else who's effectively has control or influence on that building like we were talking about with freeholders being involved in apartments and with a house that means you, there's no other involvement. So raising those buy to let mortgages is so much simpler and easier. As the lease comes with many terms and conditions, one of the things to be mindful of is what you're gonna use the property for. So traditionally it might be, well, we're just gonna put somebody in there as tenants and just rent it out. But maybe you're thinking about, well, actually I'm thinking about running it as a HMO, or maybe split it up into three or four uh, people living in that particular apartment. Or it might even be you're thinking, hey, I'm gonna operate it as service accommodation and get that much higher income than you would ordinarily. But if you are gonna do these things, you need to check whether you've got consents to do these things within the lease. Often it's the case, especially when it comes to service accommodation, these things are excluded because they don't want the excessive number of people coming and going within the building. And so they exclude the ability to be able to have short stays. So it's important that you check these things in the lease beforehand if this is what you're looking to do. Make sure you watch all the way to the end because I'm gonna break down exactly which type of apartments that I buy and also which type of houses that I buy so that you can understand exactly how I maximize our return on investment. And if you're enjoying this content, make sure you smash that like button and also subscribe to the channel as well because it just helps really to get this content out to more people just like you and spread the message. Let's now look at the disadvantages of buying houses as investment property. 
Well, one of the biggest ones is you're generally gonna need more money to be able to buy a house than you do an apartment, so it just means more money being tied up. And also with the building being a bigger building, it means there's more of it to look after, so it can be more higher maintenance costs. And that's simply just because the size of it and also you're looking after the externals as well rather than the internals only as you would probably do in an apartment. So it means, you know, these are some of the disadvantages to think about in buying houses. And you know, if you watch the video this far, first of all, well done and thank you. But you'll also have realized, hey, there seems to be a heck of a lot of disadvantages when it comes to apartments and say houses. And I agree with you. And I said I'd also share with you why I invest in both. But however, there's certain types of niches I invest in rather than all houses and all apartments. Now my preference is generally speaking to prefer to buy houses, or buy a full house, but also my real interest is in trying to maximize the return that we put in in any particular property. That might be my money, might be my investors that invest with me, putting their money into projects. I wanna get the best possible returns we possibly can. So I'm interested in maximizing that rent and often that means we might be turning into HMOs, really just to be able to get a much higher return. So essentially what I'm looking for in a house is where I can maximize the amount of income I'm generating. And that's if it's a HMO, it just means the amount of incomes being collected are significantly higher and ultimately leads to a much higher return on investment. And if you wanna learn more about the type of HMOs I tend to do and how I convert those, then we'll put a link up a video up here for you so you can watch that in a short while. But when it comes to apartments, what type of apartments is I invest in? I'm definitely not a big fan of buying a single unit apartment comes with all the headaches that we just talked about and you know maybe I'm a little bit biased but I'm just not really a big fan of those somebody else having control and influence in terms of what you can do my preference is when it comes to apartments is try and buy the block i.e be the freeholder as well so you buy the block with the apartments in there whether it's two three five you know whatever it is you're able to do i'm not talking about necessarily buying a tower of 200 apartments it could be just a very small building but you own and control everything that happens in that building so you own all the apartments you own the building the land it sits on so you have control over what costs you incur where and means that now you've got the benefit of both worlds while you've got apartments and uh, sort of what the benefits that come with them but also you've got the benefit by owning the building as you would do in a house as well so you don't necessarily have all the complication and the cost involved with that as well there is however an exception when it comes to apartments that i would consider and that's when we have a benefit in the freehold so what that means is that when you're buying an apartment within a building you also get a portion a percentage of the freehold of the building let's say you've got 10 apartments and when you're purchasing one of those apartments you get a tenth share of the freehold in that building so you'll get so effectively the people who own the building also have an interest in how that building is run and, and operated which is very different from when there's a freeholder that is, doesn't actually own any of the property in the building uh, as well so that's an exception that i would look at when it comes to leasehold this is actually a very very complex area and i've just done a quick overview of the things to consider and think about the advantages and disadvantages of each but ultimately you have to think about which is going to be the right type of strategy for you and it may be that you're baked down in the southeast and it's not so easy to be able to get onto the property ladder and buy a house and you know it could be the starting price from where you are maybe it's a million pound for a house and that really doesn't make sense as a buyer to let you don't necessarily have the deposit the 250 odd thousand pound put as a deposit and stamp duty and everything else and maybe you can only get onto the ladder with an apartment but if you are doing that it's just important to be aware of all these things that i'm sharing with you now to take into consideration as well what I've got lined up next for you is a video where a 7.2 million pound apartment building was set up no money down. If you want to watch that, make sure you click over here to watch that video. But just before you do that, make sure if you haven't already, click down here on my face to subscribe to the channel. That way you get notified when we're releasing these videos. And I look forward to seeing you on this next video just over here.